I was muted. <laughs> That's okay. Um, does anyone have rape two that they'd like to discuss this week? <clears throat> All right, well, there was nothing in the open agenda, but if anything comes up when we get to it, uh, let me know. John, do you want to take it away? Do you want an honest answer? <laughs> no, no, I don't. <laughs> take it away, I don't. The uh, 36 uh, logic controller boards, I picked them up Tuesday. Uh, they look fantastic. I powered one up last night. It was pulling the right amount of current for the 5-volt supply, so I powered up to 3.3-volt supply. It was pulling the correct current. I hooked them both up. That was pulling the correct current. I hooked up an antenna to the GPS unit, and after three minutes, it locked in. And then I noticed that the backup battery was not charging. And just this morning, I determined that the dual cathode, dual common cathode Shocky diodes turn out to be dual common anode diodes. So I obviously screwed something up or something got changed. So I have to swap all those out because it does a very good job of discharging the batteries. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, I ordered rechargeable batteries. Otherwise, I'd be replacing the batteries as well. You can't you can't just do it in software and multiply by negative one. I yeah. tried that, but it all just <laughs> Bill just gave me the finger wag, and that was the end of that. So. <laughs> An analog. <laughs> so I have to figure out if I screwed up the order, or if DigiKey screwed up the order for the parts or something, but it's it's a two-dialed fix. So unfortunately, these aren't going to go this. These, these aren't 100% working out of the right out of the gate. So, But at least I figured out what's going on. Uh, on these, I have to check out the data control engine, the magnetometer interface, the RF frequency th synthesis, and as well as the Pico subsystem and the GPS units and the Leo Bognar interface. So I've got a little bit of work to do yet, but it's looking promising. Um, I reached out to, what was his name, Madrid? At Scram Majid. G. Majid. Yeah. The first letter, right? Um, yes. He was... I guess I didn't emphasize enough that I needed these things now. Um, so I asked him if I could have a front panel STL file to print tomorrow because I want to ship a unit out to Kung and a unit out to Bill on Monday if I can get my act together and get these these things tested, at least a couple of them tested and working. So he agreed to that. I haven't seen it yet, but it's not Friday yet, so we'll see. So hopefully there'll be a front panel on these boxes, red boxes, as they come out. Other than if I don't get it, I'll have to jury rig it to keep the boards inside the box. And then, yeah. Anyway, moving forward, looking good. Um, trying to think, oh, I got the 20 magnetometer boards from Dave Witten, as well as I ordered the final 10 RM3100. So I will have 20 of the RM3100s, which will plug into the magnetometer boards, and we'll have those to ship out if the person indicating they're interested in doing the work to install one. So, haven't tested the boards yet, but I'm sure they'll work. Got a question for you, John. Yeah. Um, I pinged you about the, the cost of these boards, and uh, I understand that they're not grant funded. Um, I'm wondering if you're soliciting grants from other uh, agencies or organizations. I am not. I am so buried with trying to get stuff out. I can't even if, get up to I, water if it's, from here every now and then. <laughs> there, I think there is still some money in the original DAISY grant that includes magnetometer support. Um, that is so um, if we find out how much they cost. Uh, it, we might be able to just fund them and re reimburse reimburse that. Dave Witten has donated the twenty boards. Okay. And but I he, purchased the may uh, not... parameters. They're twenty six bucks a piece for the actual module. Okay. I mean, like that's something we could probably charge very easily. Because so. I got like five hundred twenty in the magnetometer boards. I had to order some connectors, so. We're well under, I don't know what, what 
Dave has into it, but I'm guessing it's yeah. probably less than 10 bucks a board. Okay. But, but yeah, so I, I mean, if, if it is, if that is something that someone wants reimbursed, I think that would probably get reimbursed by probably by NJIT. Um, okay. But, but definitely if you need funding for magnetometer stuff, uh, please talk to me and we might be able to make that happen pretty easily. Yeah, the, the yep. magnetometer RM3100s themselves, I'm able to charge to our grant. Okay. So the only thing outstanding and, and the connectors and whatnot will go to that as well. Um, yeah. Boards themselves, I'll have to ask Dave if, if he wants to get reimbursed for those. Okay. Because it's three boards. So, and he had the only, uh, ALC. The Andy Foundation will make a donation in support of uh, whatever activity is going on. If it's well defined and there is a well defined um, organization prepared to receive the mm -hmm. funds. Uh, and we've also done grants to individuals. So, if you wind up with a modest um, shortfall of some sort, uh, mm -hmm. ping me and we'll see what we can do. Great. I appreciate that, Ori. Thank you. The, the NJIT grant for the magnetometers is like the original DAISY grant. It nominally ends this December, and we're already on our second no-cost extension. So there's actually a, a good reason to spend that money if we coordinate with Yeoman. Let's see. I've also been running spectrum tests on the board set uh kung i had sent him three one hour shots of 5 10 and 15 and unfortunately the plots didn't make any sense because they didn't show up in the right part of the spectrum so i'm not sure if he was not grabbing the right set of numbers because it sort of looked like he was always grabbing radio one's numbers for radio two and radio three but i hopefully hopefully that's what it was because the plots didn't make any sense to me but we'll figure that out um yeah, so uh, Kung, and, Kung and I met this morning, and uh, Kung uh, gave me a good tour of uh, the uh, prototype setup we have in the next room over here. We I went over his uh, visualization code, uh, looked at your data files a little bit. He talked to me a little bit about what you were doing um, with the um, working with Bill Blackwell on trying to uh, debug debug those. So do you want to? Yeah, so Kung, you might want. Want to say something? Yeah, so the three plus that I sent you are uh, channel one of each of the three. Ah, oh, that explains it. Good. Yeah, that won't work. Because <laughs> the second plot needs channel two and the third plot needs channel three. That explains it. Okay, good. So, so wait, wait, wait. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, So I guess we had a question. So you sent him three data files. Um, one said R1, one said R2, and one said R3, right? right. But each but of those three all... radios data in them. Yeah. Yeah. Initially, I thought that each of these files are uh, just one channel. Right. Be... And radio one channel. should have been the first channel, radio two is the second channel, radio three is the third channel. So is there is there a difference in the data in the different files? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So wait, what, what's, what's the difference between the three files then? Well, what you've got is the raw data file collected for all three radios simultaneously. And okay. what I did on channel one for the R1 file has a one kilohertz sine wave from the one or five megahertz input. Channels two and three should be silent. On the radio two file, you will have silent channels on radio one and radio three, and radio two will have the one kilohertz tone on it. And then okay. radio three will have Radio 1 and Radio 2 silent, with Radio 3 having the 15 megahertz down converted carrier on it. Okay, great. And each of those are supposed to have pure 1 kilohertz sine waves, right? Correct. So I suggested to Kung that he might plot in the time domain the first 0 0.01 seconds. Yeah. So we should see, we should, should see a perfect um, sine, wave. Set, sine wave where we can actually count 10 cycles, Yep. right? Yep. Okay. You get an excellent, excellent way to, to debug it. Um, you can also, if, well, actually that's with running with the radios. Uh, yeah. You, sh you might see a little bit bleed over. I don't know. Uh, I haven't had a chance to test all that, but yeah, that's, it, it looked, he, yeah. What you sent me looked like what I was thinking it was. You're always doing channel one. 
which on the radio two and radio three files doesn't make any sense because there's nothing there. Well, not really much. There's a little bleed over, but that's part of the system test. Uh, let's see, what else have we done? Been running long-term tests on Bill's fix for the buffer overflow issues. I've run it now. We've had a two-day run with no errors, and I've got another run finishing up tonight. It'll be two, day, two days. I suspect will be the same thing. So I think we're getting really close to closing that one out, but I'll let Bill expand on that because I'm not sure where we are on that. Um, and then we've got some issues with uh, the frequency measurement stuff, and we'll, we will be fixing that. Um, like I say, we're trying, I'm trying to get hardware out so that Kung and Bill have a first set of hardware that's real with the Leo Bodnar as the eight megahertz frequency source for the system. Because I've been throwing Kung for a loop because he's trying to write code to program the U blocks and his code is, or his setup is different than mine because I shut off the eight megahertz and his is turned on because he's still using it. And I think I confused him for a bit, but um, making progress on that. He's also working on trying to get that GPS daemon working so that it sets the system time. And I've got the Leo Bodnar programming now working on the system so we can actually program the Leo Bodnar to eight megahertz through the grape. And I haven't installed yet the auto upload for the transfer files, but that's just going to be a carbon copy of what I did on grape one. Other than that, I haven't been up to much. Um, <laughs> throw it over to Bill. All yours, Bill. Oh, um, well, I, I drove to Florida and, uh, so I've been setting up uh, my grade two development here um, in my other location um, and uh, just uh, sort of been offline for a few days, uh, but starting to pick back up. Um, uh, just tying up a few loose ends and um, getting the long, long duration runs, uh, as John mentioned, uh, running and, and uh, checking for errors. I think we've got the bugs fixed and uh, we just need need more time, you know, to to just develop a little more reliability uh, data. Um, other than that, um, I think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, I've got the distro, the new distro for the Grape 2 started. I've got the tool set installed. Um, next thing to do is to figure out how we are going to update all of these grapes. And I'm thinking about setting up a GitHub account that's read-only that the unit will go out and query every night automatically with a uh, cron tab job, keeping the system files that are the running files up to date. So if we want to push out any updates, they happen automatically. Uh, one of my students here has shown me how to do a VPN login to all remote systems. And I may look into doing that if he can get that. He's got it working. I just want to see how hard it is to do, which would allow us to actually log into each one of these 30 systems and actually tweak things from an administ administrator point of view. So that could be helpful. Um, other than that, yeah, the distro is in, in works. Um, I think we're in good shape, but the boards I got back from the board house look phenomenal. I mean, the solder joints are impeccable. They did a phenomenal job. Uh, I can't, I mean, it's just, you look at it and it's like, wow, these guys know what they're really doing. They are meticulous. They did a phenomenal job. It's clean. It's there's everything is just perfect. So I am really happy with the Henry board house. Oh. They uh, did a phenomenal job. They're located here in uh, Hudson, Ohio. Yeah, H-E-N-W-A-Y is correct. I think it's Henway Industries, if I remember right. But anyway, they did a phenomenal job, really easy to work with. They're on top of it. So if anybody else has boards they want manufactured, I would give them a high, high recommendation. And they also made me a video 
on the actual manufacture of the border, all the, from the process of doing the so screening through the pick and place, through the IR reflow, yeah. to the manual yeah. place. And I'm going to have that at the ham site as part of my presentation of making of a grade. That so sounds fantastic, John. That's, it that's really cool. <laughs> And I'll show all the test fixtures and solder fixtures and assembly fixtures and all that stuff that I had to make to support this that it goes on unnoticed behind scenes. But if you don't have it, things don't go well. So, you know, John, as long as you are doing you have a video and things like that. Last year, the AWRL did a really nice video of you about the uh, group one. Um, perhaps you want to coordinate with them ahead of time and maybe oh. you can update. Um, and that way you might have a little more time to prepare or they might have a little bit more time to, pre to prepare because I thought that video from last year was fantastic. Yeah, this will definitely show what goes on behind the scenes for how you produce a product and get it out shipped. <laughs> There's a whole lot yeah. of stuff going on behind the scenes. Also, my presentation time is probably going to be more than 20 minutes. So is there a possibility I could grab two time slots? Um, Write that. Can you... Submit yeah, an abstract and write that in email. there. Yeah, I'll write it in an email. There, because there's I'll I have to. There's a lot of things I have to balance. Another possibility that we can do is um, you get a 20 minute time slot on Friday, and then Saturday we had these breakout sessions where there were um, you know, some there were some oral presentations Saturday afternoon that wasn't plenary, but we gave them like a full hour. Oh, okay. So, so, you know, we'd have to talk to Christina and Nathaniel Vishner and those people about logistics for supporting that sort of thing. But I could see you do a 20 minute talk on Friday and then you say, if you want to see all the extra special details, come to my special presentation on Saturday afternoon. OK, I will yeah. work with them on that, but I'll. Yeah. yeah. And, and then and as I said, we have to see which um once the abstracts come in and all of that and we're we kind of round out the whole program, we'll figure out the right way to balance all of the different times. Okay. I think that's all I have. Kung, do you have anything else? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so okay. I've just been uh, generating the, the spectral spectrograms to track down the, uh, the aliasing bug. And then the other one is the setting up the GPS, GPS demo, as, as you mentioned. Uh, Jonathan Rizzo, KC3 EEY, reached out to me about this, uh, about, about the, the daemon. He has a lot of experience with this system for his VLF projects. We we are using two different hardware, but uh, but it's fortunate that uh, both both systems are using the same generic NEMA stream, so it should be should be compatible. That should be exactly what you want. Yeah. So I'm gonna follow up on with him on that to to hopefully get this this figured out soon. Yeah, that's pretty much for me. Okay, back to net, Rachel. Okay, so this is kind of still in progress. Um, just wanted to check in with Gary really fast. Did you update the form on the website? Oh, uh, yes, I did. It's it now grape two specific, and it has added a question about the magnetometer. Lovely, thank you. And I also noticed you added more questions on last week's minutes. I assume that was for today. Yeah, I never figured this system out yet, so thank you for catching that. <laughs> yeah, that's and below if, you an updated block diagram. Oh, linked as well. I also want to send out a big thank you to Gary. He came in and we had a. Uh, session where we put all of the hard drives into their cases and formatted them for the grape two usage. And unbeknownst to me, his prior experience at Lincoln Electric makes him a piece part manufacturing. Unbelievable. I can't keep up with him. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be flat out. Yeah. Him doing pieces part production is his main <laughs> And boy, did he blow me out of the water. He was like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay. But yeah, we got them done. We got 36, 35 units done in an hour and a half. That includes putting them in the case, formatting the drives, testing them, and then putting them back in the boxes. So thank you, Gary, for your help. That was sincerely appreciated. It probably saved me many hours of work. So 
Uh, my just to explain further, my old employer, the, the people in the factory were on piecework, so they got paid a certain amount of money for everything they made. So that was their incentive system to clip along at a good pace. So that's what <laughs> thirty-four years of that around me, I, I know what it's like. Yeah, he showed me what it was like. <laughs> I don't think I would survive in that environment, man. <laughs> I guess you get used to it, but wow, you're focused. And it's like, anyway, back to now. Yeah, speaking of focus. Um, <laughs> I'm not focused today. <laughs> number. Four, well, I was just going to go through and sequentially ask you any of these questions or all of these questions that Gary had. Oh, okay. Actually, 4A four, four is probably for Nathaniel, I think. If, uh, yeah. If could, in, in Stan. Yeah, I, I don't have any real update on 4A. I think it's still in progress. Um. I, as you can imagine, working with uh, military institutes involves a certain additional level of bureaucracy than a standard installation. Um, I can tell you that they are still engaged. In fact, I was invited to uh, give a presentation for them uh, later this month, or not later this semester. So I'm I'm hoping what, what I'd really like to do, and I don't know if this is possible, but um, there's two possible dates uh, I think the 10th, April 10th and 12th, right after the eclipse. Uh, I'm hoping that I can go up there in person and take my classes with me and have them get to meet the uh, cadets in person. Um, I also have been uh, working with, uh, in contact with uh, Colonel, yeah, so Jason, Jason Durr, who is the person who has uh, the grape, uh, Dr. Durr, he's the uh, one that invited me up. Um, I've also been working with Colonel Hamilton, who's the um, faculty advisor to their radio club, W2GKY, I think, or KGY. I better get that right. Um, he um, he is planning on coming in person to the HAMSI workshop. Uh, we're also doing a project with my communication systems class, where we want my communication systems class to uh, do a satellite QSO uh, with the West Point uh, station. And so I'm hoping that they're able to be successful with that. And I'm hoping that I'm able to take all of them up to uh, West Point for a tour. So um, all these things are work in progress. So basically to say, yeah, no, I don't think we've seen any data from their grape yet, but I think they are still engaged and we're continuing to work with them. Nice. Okay, that's good news, thanks. Sure. John, is there a complete total official count of grape to be deployed? I thought this well, was the around. target build was 30 units. I have probably, if everything works out and I got everything, we'll have 35. Because I'm keeping one in pieces parts for development. And Bill's probably going to keep his. And Kung will probably keep his. So maybe that's 33 or 32, depending on the yield. But 30 is my target number is what I want to get out to be able to distribute. Okay, that makes sense because maybe Bill Engelke will need one, Kong will need one, whatever. So we'll just assume 30 are going out into the field and the rest. Yeah, that's probably a safe so. bet and have a, I'll have one. Hopefully we'll have a spare, but. Okay, that helps. Yeah. If I have less than that, Nathaniel will shoot me. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll be okay. <laughs> Yeah, but, it, but it'll be a Nerf gun, John, so don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think, and the other thing, so there's a lot of things happening here. So we've got the Grape 2 deployment. We're, I'm hoping that a certain number of people who are running Grape 1s, um, you know, there are three options. Some people will want to just exchange out their Grape 1 for a Grape 2. Some people want to run them simultaneously. If people, um, some people may just want to keep their Grape 1. So I'm hoping that we are able to somewhat expand the network and still make use of the original grape ones. And the um, the whisper demon group and perhaps um, Rob Robinette, I saw is on the call, can give an update on this. They are making very, very good progress on having a grape compatible data product to come out of their whisper demon um, stations uh, that are running the RX888 and KA9Q radio. And so I think they are they are really kind of the saviors of the Tangerine SDR project right now because uh, what 
with what they're doing, it's really moving towards the original vision of having a software defined radio version of this and the great version. So, and, and they have good coverage of stations on the Western United over the West Coast. So I think um, between these three different platforms, we're going to have a very nice data set that we can uh, dig into after the eclipse. I have a question. Sure. Um, when we're talking about finding new hosts for grade two, um, and we also have a number of grade one folks like myself who have volunteered to host the grade two, and we can provide the grade one system to somebody else. Are we uh, bound to put these stations in the United States or its possessions? Or are we allowed to consider Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean? I have contacts all over the place um, and could easily find hosts outside the U.S. But if the grant uh, would frown upon that, there are certainly plenty of places inside the U.S. that we need to expand. I'm thinking any place northwest of Denver, for example, um, is a big empty spot. So. Um, anyway, uh, thoughts on that? Maybe I'll jump in here. Um, so the grant has an original plan that says this is what we're going to do with these this minimum amount. Most of them are in the United States. Um, there's a couple in Canada. Um, I would not say that we are we are not bound that it has to be um, that particular distribution. We are allowed to uh, make judgment calls based on what we think is going to give us a, the best scientific return, and also based on what is uh, practically, what we are able to practically do based on uh, where our volunteers are and things like that. So um, I think what I've told, you know, Gary is, um, he is the one that's working on citing all these things. Um, I would say in general, we want to try to keep to the original map as best as possible. And then certainly if we, um, if we have that sufficiently covered, uh, we and we see scientific value in putting it in these other places, I would say go for it. Also, if a particularly interesting location becomes available, um, you know, that and there's a compelling reason that we're like, okay, this seems like a, you know, a really good opportunity, uh, we should probably jump at that too. And we can evaluate some of those on a case by case basis. Okay. okay. Um, I'm thinking someplace within one or two hops of uh, WWV in Fort Collins would probably be the most useful. So that's about 5,000 to 7,000 miles, depending on the hop. Yes, I would um, say that. And don't, don't forget, we're also listening to CHU, and we're also listening to WWV. So, okay. I mean, if you if you consider those transmitters in relationship to um you know in relation to the eclipse so we've been trying to get um i'd say like midpoints that cross the path of totality um is what we're between so where the path of totality is in the mid midpoint between um the transmitter and the receiver i think that's one of our main goals okay um, also, one note, uh, there will be a, an article published on the DX Engineering um, on all bands blog. Uh, nominally, uh, mostly it's about the solar eclipse QSO party and how to participate, but it also mentions the great um, project. So we may get some interest off of that. Thank That's you. That's really great. Um, I also want to make a, I don't know if we're the right part is to talk about this. But um, Michael Howen uh, has started working on some algorithms to hopefully differentiate between uh, WWV and WWVH. And he sent me some plots um, that have taken uh, either, um, I can't remember, I think it's KA9Q um, grape compatible data um, and has started 
um, trying to come up with plots that say, do you see WWV or WWVH or both? And we're starting to see some patterns emerge. Um, this still needs to continue to be, um, uh, debugged is the right word or, or validated, uh, but um, that is um, in progress. Okay, question E. Yes. Wait, there was one on power supplies. Did we miss that one? No, we uh, haven't got there yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, the word, the one, uh, this, these were kind of the same question, so I grouped them together. I would like to, uh, I like to finish the question discussions on the map real quick, and then we'll move into the hardware if that's okay. Hi. Can I uh, share my screen, please, Rachel? Yep. I was actually going to go pull one up myself and stick it in the minutes. So this helps. All right. Let me see if uh, there we let's see. Man, there's a lot of junk on my screen. Um, anyhow, I, I realize this is, this is an eye test. And I haven't uh, finished it yet. Ah, oh, I like yeah. that. But this this is, we've gotten roughly 300 responses since last June on people interested in hosting grapes. And obviously we've got a, quite a few people out there already. Um, wow. is all the, are the Zoom pictures covering up the right-hand side of the Eastern Seaboard or can you see the whole map? I can see the whole map. Oh, okay, good. Um, I just need to figure out how I can see the whole map. <laughs> uh, there, um, you can see that there's a, a lot of interest along the Eclipse Path from Texas through the Midwest out, out of Maine, and even we've got some New Brunswick and New Nova Scotia stations to be right in the path. Uh, we've got a reasonably good coverage uh, here, which is across the path between there and WWV. Uh, as Ward said, we've got less coverage to the northwest, or less interest. We've got a few stations in Alberta. And uh, I think one or two other provinces too. So we can get some people up further north if we want. And a couple of stations in Hawaii and one in Alaska these, that we've been talking about. Are these stickers like for the New York? Is that 16 means 16 people in there? Right. That's that's how many responses I've got. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, we need <laughs> 300 great twos, John. <laughs> right. But anyhow, this is what I've got to sort through. Okay, how come there's none in Massachusetts? Uh, um, there? I'm sorry, I cut you guys off the map. That's right here. There's a big number in Massachusetts. Okay. Like 11 or 14 or something like that. I don't know. That um, might be free and cut them off there. You just. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's some interesting people in the mix. Phil Gladstone is in there, and, uh, which, which would be an interesting one as well. Um, one thing we've got to think about. Uh, yeah, I mean, you guys in the New England desirable. grape group, what's that? I say you want geographically desirable uh, positions. Right, right. Um, I mean, you guys in the New England grape group have done so much for us, but you also, you currently have a lot of grape ones running up there. Oh, yeah. And I know you're also interested in getting some grape two, so we probably need to talk about it at some point, is that we only got 30 grape twos, we want to increase our coverage in the New England, which is already pretty strong, or do we want to think lean toward other areas of the country? So yeah, yeah I'm thinking, are, am I still on the list? Because yeah, I'm in David, I think you were on the list. Yes. Well I'm in New Hampshire. I don't see it listed. Oh it, it's it's off to the side over here because I couldn't I cover to cover up the whole darn map if I would have very good. That's an extra 20 bucks, David. Just make the check yeah. out to me. I managed <laughs> to get Vermont up there, but <laughs> well, we're right on the border, so in some ways we actually get listed as Vermont. Really? That close, huh? Yeah. I can see Vermont from my uh, office window. But can you see Russia? <laughs> it only yeah. matters if you're running for office. Yeah. So anyhow, so I've got a big a big data set to work with. Uh uh, let's see here. Hold on a sec. Uh, all right. Did numbers come up? I should, you guys should be seeing a spreadsheet. Yep. So I've been trying to sort these out a little bit. I've got our uh, Alberta, Alaska. Cal we don't have a lot of coverage in Southern California, believe it or not. We could add some. Uh, a few in the Northwest, uh, the Midwest, even Iowa. 
Minnesota. We've got some folks that are RF engineers and some good, and we've got all the people in the New England Grape Group, of course, Utah, Washington, and then we've got a couple people I've gotten answers from to the three uh, cases. So, so I'm working through this. Um, I'm not sure exactly what process we're going to use, but I've got a lot more volunteers than I have equipment, and I'm not sure it should be 100% my decision. Um, maybe I need to whittle it down a little more uh, and have somebody look at what I've chosen before I go out to these people. And because some of these people may not, you know, replied last July. Maybe they've changed their minds. They've moved. You know, they're on to other things. I don't know. So it might I, be helpful I, to make a list of the criteria of your selections. What what's the selection criteria? Right. That might you know, help. Most, yeah. No, that, that's true. Mostly, it's trying to follow the CDAR map, which which you know means we want coverage uh, across or near the eclipse path. So I mean, that's that's the first. Now, are we thinking about reception sites that are actually affected there you go. by the bounce point? You know, assuming the bounce point's in the reflection path, I presume is a selection criteria. Right, right. I mean, what? knowing that, should I, are, you, are, are we suggesting that I not worry too much about the Northwest because it's a long way from the eclipse, or do we just focus on this? the eastern seaboard and, and the Midwest and, and obviously the Northeast too as well. Well, I'm thinking in longer terms than just the eclipse. Obviously we've got the eclipse coming up here in two months, but it's gonna take a month to get a great system, set, you know, package systems shipped, brought online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be thinking about what happens after the eclipse and Gary and I, uh, we've talked about this at, during the um, solar eclipse um, meetings, like the one this afternoon. It's like, well, then what? You know, oh, well, the next one's in 40, uh, 21, uh, 2041 or something like that. What do we do in the meantime? So um, as we start looking for spots, I think we need to start think, thinking about the long-term broader data collection problem. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, yeah, I think along with that, we need to uh, figure out how to, because there's a, there's a lot of science that can be done with this beyond the eclipse. And even the uh, proposal that we're currently working on outlines that just looking at dawn and dusk, but, you know, there are solar flares, there are geomagnetic storms, you know, how can we use this to, um, you know, better understand HF propagation for uh, regular amateur communications. Um, there, there's so, so many things. So I think maybe part of our messaging will have to be um, to figure out how to let people know that we're working on these things, figure out how to get people to be engaged in working on these things as well, give them reasons to keep their grapes on. Because yeah, once we have this network built, and the eclipse is over. We're, like it's not like go home. There's a ton of stuff happening in the ionosphere, but we need to, you know, figure out how to convince people that this is interesting to look at. And oh, I I think identify a large CME, for example, which affects a big spectrum, uh, lots of different types of communications, um, and analyze it, and then put that out in the the amateur. Uh, press, for example, just, uh, hey, uh, we had this big problem. Everybody could see the northern lights. This came in. This happened. This happened. Here's what the data looked like. And by golly, you can participate in data collection, too, um, and not just tie it to the abstract. Well, we need to, you know, collect this data so we have yeah. a better understanding, which is actually the bigger problem or the bigger benefit from this. But if you want to get people excited, you have to give them something yes. that they experience themselves and big solar flares and big CMEs, I think uh, are, are two good targets that hams can experience and understand in a, a way that it, it really affects day-to-day -day, uh, operation. And yeah, and maybe, and I think you're right, maybe putting out, you know, continuing to put things out in the amateur publications um, is really nice because there's generally a much shorter turnaround time on that than in the uh, 
than the peer reviewed publications. And um, it's potentially something that, you know, amateurs and volunteers can, can write and would want to write. So those are all good, good ideas for engagement. Yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, short lead time uh, blogs and stuff out there on all bands for DX engineering is well managed and curated to some extent. Uh, QEX is a really good publication in that it goes to all ARRL members now uh, as part of the digital package. I call it the science section of the uh, Radio Amateurs New York Times. And it comes out with that package every month. And mm -hmm. Rick uh, or uh, Kai Siwiak, KE4PT, is always looking for material. So if we set up something that was like a quarterly, um, predictable, um, one or two page item, like what happened in the ionosphere this week, you know, this quarter, then I think, um, you know, people would start looking for that. It wouldn't have to be a one-off every time with the long lead time. And the, the problem will simply be filling two pages of material on a regular basis. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, that can, it can take, take on the entire, you know, AMSI, uh, you know, dataverse there and tackle whatever project happens to be ongoing. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a really good model. Yeah, I think it'd be nice too to kind of also interface back to the ham community. Um, so it'd be a really good way to not just like be like, and then your data goes off into the scientific void. Yeah. <laughs> it would it also be a good opportunity for an intern or somebody who hasn't had a peer reviewed paper uh, to write something and say, hey, look, I got a publication. Uh, yeah. A lot of people would benefit. Yes. That was a good idea. Um, and I think the, the NSF, you know, will appreciate it too. And uh, because they, with these grants, there's a broader impact section that you're evaluated on as well. And part of that is, you know, how many people are you engaging? How are you getting it out to the, you know, the citizen science aspect of it? So it, it really helps to show that uh, community engagement and it really is an amateur, you know, amateur sort of thing. So I, I think that's really, really good. All right, so what I what I kind of take away from that discussion is, uh, unless there's any objections, I'll continue to use my, uh, my best judgment. Um, uh, obviously, we got to meet the grant requirements, but if we spread the stations out a little bit, a little bit more, uh, that's probably a good thing for the long term uh, long-term viability of the the whole great project is that is that a true statement mm -hmm. yeah. okay gary. gary if you want another person to talk to while you're doing that i volunteer myself no yes rachel i i, I have no problem putting another set of eyes in this because there may be something i missed or overlooked or some idea that just completely went over my head so okay because we can also since we have this grape one map that's very filled out, we can kind of be a little bit more flexible, I feel like, with the station selection, as long as these grape stations are going to stay on, because we've already filled out, you know, good portions where we wanted to on the map. Right, right. That. Next question. <laughs> okay, let me... Uh... Can I put the uh, system diagram up on the screen real quick? Because this is yep. important to the deployment too, understanding what people are actually going to be getting. And I still have to finish that. Yeah. Screen. So I this is a draft, folks. It's not 100%, not. not 100 percent perfect. But anyhow. It's pretty um, darn close. Uh, fold this down. So my my main question, I guess, for John is, is you know, when, when people are going to hook this up at home, they obviously need an antenna. We, we, su we supply the GPS antenna. Um, we've talked mm -hmm. about wired Ethernet. We put these things in a metal box, the Raspberry Pis. Mm -hmm. So I want to make this clear that people are going to want to use wired Ethernet. 
Um, the, the, well, the hard drive is, what's that, John? That's one of your selection criteria. Right. I have my uh, grapes in, I have my grapes in metal boxes and I'm using them wirelessly. Well, what I does I think work I amazingly well. Yeah, why, why is why, especially for there, because there's no latency like requirements, it doesn't have to be real time. Why is either why is wired Ethernet a requirement? Well, the metal box covers the wireless antenna on the grate, it's yeah. sealed in the corner well, of the metal box. So, well, on the pie, there the are pie. good external I, I, uh wireless that will plug into the USB port. We use them. I I spent a lot of time scraping the paint off of a, a die cast box for my grapes and or for my raspberries. And they with with everything that gets plugged into it, there seems to be plenty of signal uh, Yes. Hmm. So that, I, I I I mean I I was concerned about it, but that's so at least that, one one dot on the curve. So is I, but it works fine with my home wireless network. Yeah, it really depends on how yeah. close you are to the Some router. Some Wi-Fi will sneak out of the box. We actually, we have ours in a metal box. Um, so I was suspicious about the signal strength in yeah. an installation. We have wired, it's running wired. wireless. I have an external dongle that does oh, work fine. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, but wired Ethernet puts a big restriction on where you can locate the device. Okay. Well, what I said last time is, you know, that's that's the first choice. Then I'll tell people mm -hmm. wired Ethernet will work. I mean, that's one hundred percent reliable. That's good. That's, and that's, if you want to use Wi-Fi, it's kind of it's it's your own risk. We we've got people that have been successful with it, but because of the metal case, the Wi-Fi signal is down considerably. I think Hams will understand that. Yep. So yep. I can I can I can make that change. Um, the next most important thing is the power supply. How are we going to power these units up when people get them? Got it covered. I've already bought the power wall work power supplies to power the units. And right now there is a second one that runs the four terabyte drive. I'm in the process of testing my supply to see if it will supply, or that 1203 amp power supply will supply the terabyte, four terabyte drive as well, in which case we'd have one wall work to plug in. But the power supplies will be provided. Okay, that helps. Tremendously. Okay. And then this one will be kind of be a question mark. I can, that's not. It might be a, a second one topic. for the ter four terabyte drive because it comes yeah. with, but I'm thinking I might be able to pull it off and have it run because my little 12 volt switcher will provide six amps at five volts. Okay. Hopefully that's actually that's coming off the 12 volt supply because I think it's a 12 volt to the four terabyte drive, but yeah, we're, we're working on it. Okay, Hope, hopefully that 12 volt supply is quiet because his word will tell you that the other, we had some noisy ones last time, so. Well, it might be noisy, I don't know. It's not noisy okay. for the grape, <laughs> let's just put it that way. All right, those are my main questions. You know, this internal wiring and stuff, people, I mean, they're gonna get it in a tested package. So that's, that's the big thing, the power supply and the ethernet, so. Yeah. And we're not supplying antennas this time either. People need to understand and need to come up with their own antenna. So, yeah. all right, so back to the minutes then, Rachel. I'm trying to think what was next. Rachel, you muted yourself. Did, I was going to share screen, sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, next on the question block are the Wi-Fi and VNC client. Yeah, what, yeah. what's the status on the VNC client on this build do you, uh, you guys think is gonna be? It looks doable. I have not pursued it with my student yet. Uh, he's done it. So I suspect it's just me sitting down and doing it. I have not had the bandwidth yet. I'm sort of tied up a little bit with trying to get these boards all operational and start getting them distributed. I mean, my goal is to be shipping units by the end of this month. Right. So that's what pretty much last time I told people, you know, the ideal situation is you've got a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. We think you'll be able to run headless eventually. 
but it may not be that way right out the door. I mean, that's just where we're at. Well, the intent right now is to run headless, but to set it up, you're going to want to see it with something. And unless you can, you're tech savvy enough to figure out what the IP address, you can VNC into it. Oh, I'm sorry, VNC. I was thinking of, yeah, the VNC client's installed and working. That's already done. Oh, okay. I was thinking That's of great news. I was thinking that, VPN into the units from an extra outside source. Sorry. No, that, that that'll make a lot of people happy. That makes my job easier. So yeah, the VNC client's installed, and that's all I ever use. Okay, great. And now uh, that that's it for me with a minute to go. Perfect. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say for most updates, then hold. Uh, expect some emails about this. Um, as everything is on less fire than it was before. Um, I'm going to kind of try to get on. lot of, I won't say nothing's on fire, but there, there's been some reduction. Um, and I'd reduction like to get, of anxiety. <laughs> yes, get a, get a solid start in on this. Um, does anyone else have any open questions, comments, concerns, or anything urgent? I, I, like I have a couple of questions or one, one is, or thoughts, it would be nice to have a map of FL Digi stations. Hmm. Um, yeah. Just th that thought. The other one is going back to um, the stations that we've shipped. There are, in the Southwest, there's two stations we've shipped that have, this kind of connects to the eclipse question, um, that have been off the air since after the eclipse. I think the Lake Havasu and the N2IC are ones we shipped. I'd have to look at the list. But I think the more stations we get, the more we have to think about pinging people saying, are you still interested or um, can we get the station back to go somewhere else? Uh, just a thought. The, um, the, the last one is the third station in the Southwest, um, TBG. That station doesn't exist as far as I know anymore. So as we get more stations on the map, we have to think about cleaning up stations that haven't uh, uploaded in a year. Hmm. Because he sent me his grapes, which we've reused. Um, that was long story there. But anyway, I if you look at the observations, I don't think there's been an observation since maybe even before the eclipse, but so keeping the database and the map clean. And full. Maybe we need to set the expectations beforehand that these grape deployments are not considered a spike in time, but it's a continuous ongoing evolution. Well, that's right. We've kind of emphasized the eclipses Right. It's kind of goalposts, but it shouldn't be considered the only thing. That's the first step in the door as far as we're concerned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's and, it's true. And, I, and, and as I've been sending out emails, I said we want them on the air during the eclipse and for throughout 2024 and after. So I maybe I need to emphasize that a little more, but I have been including that. This yeah. Is to be per permanent. Well, none of us are permanent, but I get—I know what you mean, George. <laughs> this is to be an insulation. The intention but... is that it's to run indefinitely, not yeah. just sporadically. That's a good word. How about long term as a term to use? That's yeah, not bad. That's good. Definitely. Well, one thing we could do to help. Hey, John, you, if, I hate to bug you with this, unless there's somebody else in Congress, somebody else can do it. A list of the stations that are currently uploading FL Digi data, and then the uh, the uh, the DNA of all the uh, uh, Grape One FL Digi, so I can put that stuff in a map because I need that too. Stands right. At least I need that for what I'm doing. Yeah, I can give you the uh, node assignment map and probably a day's dump for the database to see which nodes are actively uploading. Yeah, that'll help a lot. A lot. If you're willing. These maps. Yeah, these these maps would be really good and. Um, they're probably going to be pretty important for uh, the different presentations we're giving and things like that, too. And uh, I always seem to get people to ask, 
news reporters, how many people are participating in this thing? I, I this has become such a big deal uh, with so many aspects to it. Um, something on the ham side page would be useful. It's like, where are these stations? And then have several maps of uh, great classics, great twos, um, uh, RBN nodes, uh, anybody that has you know uploaded scientifically useful data. And as we add more, I guess modalities is the right uh, right word, uh, have more maps. So you can look at it and say, wow, look at all the RBN nodes, look at all the great nodes, look at all of this and that, and these are all the people that are participating. I think that encourages more people to participate. Yeah, we have to say, numbers yeah. up in uh, Europe. So what we need is somebody with some experience with GIS, graphical inf or geographical information systems, because I don't have it. And I, I don't think paper stickers on a map <laughs> are going to cut it much longer. So uh, if there's anybody that's got GIS know-how, uh, I mean, Google's got maps and tools and all kinds of neat stuff. We just need to figure it out. Maybe somebody's already done that. So uh, we'll, we'll ask around. I know uh, I know how to do it in Python uh, using CardoPy, but my uh, I'm bandwidth limited. Yeah, I, I agree. Yep. And Matt Love using CardoPy. It's a great student project, wonderful student project. Really? Note 42 is in Poland. Yep. So we have to get them on the map too. We got yes. British Columbia. <laughs> Netherlands. We have a note in the Netherlands. There's, there's one yeah, in there, North there Carolina. Is a, there Two there is a great DRF note in the Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah, we're all over the place. Vancouver? Yep, Vancouver's back up. <laughs> they had a power failure. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, the, there's a brand new RBN node that's going to come online shortly from Ushuaia, Argentina, at the very southern end of South America in Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego. And uh, so we will have the most southern RBN node in the world online shortly. Oh, Vancouver is the most northerly, most westerly node in the FL Digi mm -hmm. spectrum. Well, with with any luck, we'll have Alaska on soon. Yes, we are working on that. Well, you know, the takeaway from all this is information is power, and and we've got information, but it's scattered to the winds, and we need to collect it, collate it and put it in a useful format, which generally means a graphical presentation. Ideally, we do it layers. Uh, I think somebody suggested to have a DRF layer and a, a FL Digi layer and a, and a Whisper Beacon Blaster layer and so on and so forth, so we could turn these things on and off and get a nice mm -hmm. uh, nice representation. So that'd be the ideal situation, I think. So put your thinking caps on. even smaller. All right. Does anyone else have any pressing business that we should talk about today? I don't have class after this this semester, but I'm going to try to make sure we still end about on time. All right. I think that all sounds great. Yeah. And if anyone, so I'll send out the, the minutes as usual too, but if you come up with something during the week that you'd like to just stick in the minutes, minutes for next week, most of the minutes documents have already been generated, so you can access that up at the top. All right. When you hit the next, when you hit the next week button, it comes up with that little preview. Uh, so what? And then you uh, just it, link out, <laughs> and it opens a new tab for you. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, that's really nice, Rachel. <laughs> Doing it for a while, but it's okay. Um, but if you really need to find the minutes, I'll link them always in the um, the weekly updates. Okay, I was confused when it said preview. I thought it was just a, a, a view only type of thumbnail and I was kind of stuck there. So, okay. 
the it's a document. Okay, user error. That's my problem. Okay. No, I got Google. the corner in that. <laughs> did actually get to take attendance. I'll do that now before everyone logs off. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Rachel, if you want to put my call sign in, uh, it's AB4EJ. Uh, I'm blocked from being able to change my ID in Zoom by university policy, so I can't add my call sign, but uh, EJ, EJ, okay. just put it up next to my name up there. J, well, Bill Engelke. Just because I made my life easier, but I will uh, hmm. send it box, I suppose. I remember where those are and <laughs> now's your chance to change your call sign, Bill. <laughs> yeah, Rachel, can do you have an in with the FCC? Can I get a, a one to two call sign out of this or something? I mean, you could always do a vanity call sign. Well, you know, since I still have so many QSL cards that I had printed that are on this call sign, it it Yeah, there is that. <laughs> All right, any other questions, comments, or concerns? I'll check that around. Oh. oh, did I miss I missed something, didn't I? All right, any other questions, comments, or concerns, or if I missed anybody on the minutes? All right. I'm going to call that done then. Eighty-eight. Seventy-three. Seventy-three. Seventy-three, everybody. Take care, everyone. Seventy-three, everybody. Thank you. Bye.